There is something that we all do, and we do it so often and so unconsciously that we think it's normal. And yet it, by definition, will destroy our relationships. You do not want to miss what I'm going to share today. Stay with me. Welcome to this February 13th edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. I'm Katie Kennard. I gotta say, that introduction sounded like a pretty straightforward encouragement to buckle up. So here's Chip with principle number six from his series, God's Wisdom for Building Great Relationships. Someone asked me recently if I would um, just kind of step back and say, you've been a Christian a little over three decades now. Just in terms of simplified principles, if you were just going to sit down with someone over a cup of coffee and say, what are the biggest life lessons you've learned about doing relationships God's way? Doing relationships in a way so that how you relate to one another around the Word of God and the Spirit of God would actually allow both of you to become more like Christ. And so I sat down and put my feet up and got a cup of coffee and prayed and said, Lord, you know what, what is it? And so, you know, a number of different ones, like I started with it all begins with God. That was, that was my first principle. I I realize is that everyone in the world wants to tell you how to do relationships. And I realize God has laid out in his word, this is how you do relationships. And then I begin to think of other things. You know, you can't impart what you don't possess. You know, I can't give to another person in a relationship what I'm not getting from God. I've learned over the years that everyone behaves in a way that makes sense to them. That has transformed my life. It helps you step back so you don't get, you know, engaged in something where you respond emotionally. And then another principle for me is everyone is desperately insecure. And some people show their insecurity with strong reactions and powerful and, you know, they tell you what they've done and what they've accomplished and how much money they make and who they know and what they drive and, you know, on and on and on and on. And they they do that because they seem really big and you seem really small and that creates distance. And that distance makes them feel safe. And other people are insecure with weak reactions. What they do is they look at their feet, and I'm a nobody, and I can never do anything, and, you know, my mom was a nobody, my, my dad was a nobody, and, you know, I haven't done this, and I haven't done this. And, you know, they withdraw from relationships, and it creates distance. But it's rooted in the same thing. You know, once you realize everyone's desperately insecure, we just show it in different ways. Well, principle number six for me is that comparison always leads to carnality. Comparison always leads to carnality. And what I've tried to do with these little principles, I just thought, God, help me be real simple. A principle, a passage, and then some practice. What's the principle? Comparison always leads to carnality. Who's the fastest? Who's the smartest? Who's the prettiest? Who's the sexiest? Who's the best looking? Whose kids are the brightest? Did you go to this school or that school? Who has the nicest clothes? What kind of car do you drive? Where do you live? What is your zip code? People Magazine, who's the most famous? Forbes Magazine, who's the richest? When you pull up at a stoplight, unconsciously, if there's two or three lanes, you will tend to look to your right, and you will tend to look to your left. And you will unconsciously go through a series of things. You will look at what kind of car they're driving. You will make observations about how the gal is wearing her hair, not wearing her hair, how much jewelry she has, what it looks like. If it's a BMW and has number seven something with an I in the back, you make certain observations and conclusions. If it's a VW van with the peace sign and the guy has multiple tattoos and Rossiferian hair, you make certain conclusions. And you unconsciously begin to ask, where do I fit? And you gravitate like I gravitate in your humus to either feel superior or inferior or judging. You know what? I'll tell you what. Look at all those rich people and what a, what a waste of money to have that much jewelry and the poor could have been fed. And you know what? You know what? I think an Audi would be okay, but a BMW, that's totally out. Or you know what? Why didn't that guy get a bath? That's his whole problem. You know something? <laughs> that hair stinks and there's lice in it. And you know, that's the problem of this world. The 60s is over. Why didn't that guy get a life? And what I can tell you is, you don't know anything about either of them. You don't know anything about either of them. And neither do I. But it's habitual. I made a list. I I went from car to home to clothes to jewelry 
Now, I, I notice now, have you ever, ever found out like when you get engaged and then when you get a, a wedding ring or an engagement ring and ladies, do you all, I mean, please don't look at me, but have you ever tried to compare the size of the diamond uh, that someone else has with when you got engaged or um, when you're newly married, uh, do they own their house or rent their house? Or um, what school did you graduate from versus what school someone else graduated from? Is it weird that as parents, we want people to know our kids' SAT scores? <laughs> like that really changes the world. Um, we compare our kids, our schools, our education, our IQs. And all I want to tell you is every time you compare yourself with other people, whether it's your insides or your outsides or your possessions or your position, it always leads to carnality. And by carnality, I mean sin. The passage I'd like to give you is 2 Corinthians verse 10, verse 12. And uh, I'd like you to go ahead and open your Bible and look at that. And the Apostle Paul is in a situation where he's being compared. He's being compared with the, these so-called super apostles. And, and the Corinthian church is saying, you know something, you know, we, uh, you act like a real big shot when we get these letters, but, you know, we, we are not really that impressed with you. And Paul uh, really hates to do it, but defends his apostleship and talks about some amazing experiences and different things he's had. But in verse 12, he gets to the core of the issue about relationships. It says, for we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. But when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're without understanding. And is that graphic? We are not bold to compare ourselves with some of those. Paul says, I, I'm not comparing myself with other people. Why? When they measure themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're without understanding. In your notes, if you want to, you might jot down uh, 1 Corinthians 15.10, where the Apostle Paul does just the opposite. And I remember the first time I read this, and I mean, I, I never opened the Bible until I was 18, so I'm like probably 18 and a half now. I'm a Christian about six months. I'm reading through the New Testament for the first time. And when I first read this verse, I thought, this guy's like really arrogant. I can't believe he said this. I am what I am by the grace of God. And his grace did not prove vain toward me, but I labored more than all of them. Speaking of the other apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. And you know, when you really study that, he's not arrogant at all. He has an accurate assessment of himself. I am what I am by the grace of God. The brains I have, grace of God. The looks I have, the grace of God. Position I have, the grace of God. The money I have, the grace of God. The talent I have, the grace of God. The parent I have, the grace of God. I am what I am. God made me and God placed me in this family at this time with these gifts, with these strengths, with these liabilities, with these experiences, both wonderful and difficult, by his grace. And then it's interesting, what's he do? And his grace didn't prove vain toward me. I didn't compare myself with other people. I saw who God made me and where I am and what I've been through. And then I labored. I labored. I worked. I took what God gave me and who he made me. And this is, this is a time where he does have a little, little comparison. He goes, more than all of them, yet not I. Even my labor, even my energy, even my passions, even my desires... Not I, but the grace of God. And so all I'm saying is in relationships, and this is a habit that is so hard to break, is if you can begin to say to yourself, I'm going to break the habit of comparing myself with other people. I am telling you, it'll liberate you. When you can go through the checkout stand, ladies, and see the front of Cosmopolitan and Us and all the magazines and how, quote, you're supposed to look, and realize the genetic pool of which is drawn is like the upper one or two percent of all the women made in all the world. And they have, you know, airbrush surgeries and uh, money like you don't have. And they're, you know, can you imagine having the only job you have is look pretty? I remember them interviewing one lady who's noted, I won't mention any names, who's, who's noted not only for her beauty, but for her wonderfully um, articulate bodily shape. Can, can, can I say that in the right way? 
And she, she talked about five and six hours a day, the regiment she went through to keep different parts of her body looking the way they needed to look so she could get in front of a camera and make millions of dollars. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you have five or six hours a day to do, you know, buns of steel or whatever, you know? <laughs> and yet that picture flashes and you've been told ever since you were a little girl or guys, when you look at men's fitness and you see that guy with, you know, those rippled abs, they don't have six packs, they got 12 packs. But you know what? If you got five hours, now, should you be in shape, take good care of your body, all the rest? Of course. But I mean, that's a, full, a 12 pack, that's a full time job. I mean, you gotta be in the gym for hours and hours and hours. But these images of these pictures, and we compare ourselves both up or down. And the moment we do, it always leads to carnality. The principle, comparison always leads to carnality. The passage, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, the practice. Uh, let me give you three things that I think will really help you break the habit. Number one, habitually choose to view others the way God does. And jot down 1 Samuel 16, 7. Habitually choose. It's a choice. You, you, you won't naturally do this. Habitually choose to view others the way God does. 1 Samuel 16, 7. God's looking for a king. He says to the prophet, go over to uh, Jesse's house. He's got a lot of boys. One of those boys is a king, and I'll show you. All the boys line up. The prophet looks at them all, and he goes, you know, hey, you know, we got a, we got a problem here. And, you know, one of them especially is strong and mature and good-looking and big. And, you know, the father's kind of going, it's him, right? Prophet says, no, I mean, do you have any other sons? And basically all we, you know, there's, there's, there, there's you know, the little guy, you know. I mean, he's, he's young, and, and so David comes. And do you remember what the prophet says? For God sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord weighs the heart. And I don't know about you, but God has been so gracious to reprove me so uh, painfully that I am habitually uh, in the practice of choosing to look at people the way God does. I'll never forget my, uh, my greatest reproof. I was uh, preaching in California, and there was a guy uh, who came, sat on the front row, had long Rossifarian locks, had what appeared to be a dress on or a robe with a multicolored coat and a funky little hat, and he sat, you know, I always sat kind of on the front row, and I was like six or eight rows away. And the aroma of his life on the streets was reaching me six or eight rows away. And I later learned his name was Dan, and he became affectionately called Dan Dan the Hippie Man. <laughs> and I, uh, I was preaching, and I'm wondering, where, man, where is this guy coming from? I, I mean, he, if I had seen him on the streets alone, it would have been like, you know, ball my fist here. You know, he's a drug addict. I wonder where he's coming from. And if he's not a drug addict, he's a nut, you know. And so I get done preaching and I notice he's, he's really paying attention. I think that's good. You know, he's probably coming off drugs and, you know, the, the meth or the heroin or the cocaine has got him wired up or something. And I get done. And when I get done, we had these steps and I would go down these little steps. And he just came up to me like this. He goes, Pastor, it's so good to be here. I could just feel the presence of Jesus. And then he goes like this. And I mean, this guy <laughs> gave me a bear hug. And you're not, not one of those polite Christian little hugs where, you know, you, we all know it's got to be quick and, you know, man to man, you know, you know. And I mean, he's hugging me like I just gave out silver dollars and he got nine of them, you know. And, he gets to, and then he looks at me like this. He goes, oh, I'm so glad God brought me here. And I'm thinking, and then I talk to him. And this guy's in the Bible every day. He had a radical conversion. I later learned that, you know, that he came for a few weeks and he said, well, I'm back on to God's calling. And he went on the road and he, he was purposefully a homeless person sharing Christ. And then he actually made it his way about halfway across the United States and got involved in a cult. And I got this long letter about all these weird people. And, you know, I don't know much about the Bible. He's only a Christian about six months. So I write him a letter and he said, this is where you can contact me. And I gave him information about the cult. And I said, I, I love your heart. You need to get some training. He came back, walked all the way back and hitchhiked back to California, went to Bible school, later married another girl and their ministry. Boy, their wedding was wild. Uh, <laughs> and, and I mean, he ended up, he was quite a flute player, ended up on our worship team. And I'm telling you, if I have ever met someone who was Jesus, 
to people that other people won't give the time of day. It was Dan, Dan, the hippie man. We even were a part of getting him in Bible school, and he got training. And you know something? Isn't it easy to look on the outside? Oh, look at that hairdo. Look at her nails. You know, I, those nails, that'd be $65. I, I wonder if they're fake or not. Look at those shoes. You know, look at that bag. You know what? I wonder if that's one of those bags where the imprint really is, the Louis, whatever it is, or is it just a knockoff? You know, look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. You know, people's luggage coming off of racks, we make observations how they sit, how they talk, where their accent. He kind of talks like this. He sort of has a slur. He must be from this part of the country. He looks like that. He or she must not be very smart. Comparison always leads to carnality. Habitually choose to refuse to view others in any other way than God does. And uh, you will be pleasantly surprised. Second practice is habitually choose to evaluate yourself the way God does, or to look at yourself. Uh, if you'll open to Psalm 139, you know, some of us, as the Apostle Paul says, think too highly of ourselves. My experience is most of us think too lowly of ourselves. You, you need to habitually go into practice, go into training, that when you look in the mirror, rather than looking at yourself the way you do, begin to look at who you are the way God does. Here's how God looks at you. Psalm 139, verse 13. David is sharing his heart, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He says, For you formed my inward parts, and you wove me together in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame, literally my skeleton, my structure, was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. Literally the idea, your eyes saw my embryo. And in your book, they were written, all the days ordained for me, when as yet there wasn't one of them. Here's a God who knows you. You have DNA like no one else. He created you exactly the way he wanted to create you, with the color of eyes, with the personality, dropped you in the family that he would know. It doesn't matter whether you had a good dad, a bad mom, if uh, an absent God loved you so much that he knew he needed your mom and your biological dad's DNA to make the unique you. And when he looks at the unique you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are valuable. You are unique. You are precious. You matter. Not if you were taller, not if you were smarter, not if you were more outgoing, not if you were better in this or better in that. You, I mean, what he's describing, you, they hadn't learned to talk yet. This is God's view of you before you did anything. Goes on to say, how precious also are your thoughts, God, toward me. How vast is the son of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. God views you as something that matters, that is precious. He thinks of you all the time. He loves you and cares for you just the way he made you. Now, do you have a stewardship with your body to make it the best that it can be and be healthy? Sure. Do you have a stewardship with your mind? Of course. Do you have a stewardship with your gifts and your talents? Yeah. But I'll tell you what, most of us have bought into a culture where we find someone a little bit better than us and we envy them because we compare ourselves with them. And then we find someone a little bit lower than us and we compare and we are either self-righteous if we do it spiritually or we feel superior or arrogant because what really happened is we don't view ourselves rightly. You got you to look yourself in the mirror and say, God, thank you. You're all wise. You could have made me 6'2". You could have made me 5'7". You know, you could have given me blue eyes or brown eyes. You could have, you could have, and, and all the answers to God says, wait a second. I've not made any mistakes ever, ever. Not even a small one. The wisdom of God is that God brings about the best possible results by the best possible means for the most possible people for the longest possible time. Not only what he has done could not be done better, but how he does what he has done could not be improved upon. And that's who you are. And you know when you embrace that, all of a sudden, you know what? It doesn't matter what they drive. It doesn't matter what their test scores are. It doesn't matter if they went to this school or that school. 
or whether they can shoot it or kick it or play it or paint it better than you. Because God's not comparing you with any of them. You are his unique masterpiece. Comparison always leads to carnality. To break it, habitually choose to view others the way God does. Secondly, habitually choose to view yourself as God does. And third, habitually choose to measure your performance and success by answering the following questions. This is real quick, but I, I, I literally, I do this all the time. You know, I'm kind of nutso with this little three by five cards and all that stuff. I actually ask myself these questions about my performance. Okay, my performance as a father, my performance as a husband, my performance as a pastor, my performance as a friend. I mean, we, we all perform. We do things, right? And, and the question is, well, are you successful or not? We all want to be successful. And by the way, that word in Hebrew in, in Joshua, when it talks about meditating on his law in order that you can be successful, the word means prudent, to look into something in order to do your life in a way that is aligned with God's will or wisdom. And so success, real success, is figuring out how God has orchestrated life and doing life his way. And so how do you measure your success? Three questions. Question number one I ask is, did I give my very best effort? Did I give my very best effort? And I, have a, I always have a verse with these, sorry. Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do, do heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, for it is God who is going to reward you. Did I give my best effort? Am I giving my best? Is this the best shot I've get, I have as a dad? Is this my best shot as a husband? Is this my best shot on this message? Is this my best shot in this difficult situation? Did I give my best effort? Not how did I do compared to someone else who does the same thing? I mean, I, I don't want to compare myself to Chuck Swindoll and Andy Stanley and all these other. I'm not them. I don't want to compare myself to other people that are these amazing fathers from America. You know, I'm not them. The question I need to ask is, did I, first, did I give my best effort? Second, who am I seeking to impress? Who am I seeking to impress? Am I seeking to impress my wife, my kids, what people think of my, my kids? Am I seeking to impress other people? It's an audience of one. The only way you break the grip of comparison is to know success is I gave my best effort, number one. Number two, I did it unto you. I love the little song by Sarah Groves. It's called This Journey Is My Own. If you've never heard it, it's on her conversation album. It's an awesome song. And she, she has this little song where she says, you know, this journey is my own. There's a day I'm going to stand before the Lord. And she says, this journey is my own. It's not what anyone else thinks. And then she has this great line. Why should I waste my life or lose my life trying to please people, basically, that I'll never be able to please instead of God? Third question is this. Am I fulfilling my God-ordained potential? And you can jot down Matthew chapter 25, 14 through about 30. Matthew 25. See, sometimes we get real excited and, and we think, wow, I did great. Because you compare it to this person or this person or this person. And I will tell you what you'll do naturally because you want to be successful. We all find someone worse than us. If you're a 10 talent person and you score a seven, you don't get an A. But if you're, you score a seven and most of the world is a four, the whole world can think you're a winner. You are doing great. You are awesome. What a mother, what a father, what a worker, what a friend. But if God, the issue is not how are you doing relative to any other person? The issue is, how are you doing relative to who God made you? And are you extracting the potential? Because when I get before God, he's not going to ask me, well, you know, you know, these other speakers and other pastors, man, they were better than you. He's only got one question. I deposited a certain amount of gift and talent in you, Chip. How much of it did you extract? How much of it, like the Apostle Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God, and you went for broke, and you disciplined yourself, and you were diligent, and you did it unto me, and I gave you this much, and you really used this much. You didn't coast on gift. You didn't compare yourself with other people. You became all I designed you to be. Because at the end of the day, that will be the measuring stick. Comparison always leads to carnality. The key verse... 2 Corinthians 10, 12. The habits are three and they're simple. Habitually choose to view others the way God does. 
habitually choose to view yourself the way God does and measure success not by how you do with others, but compared to who God made you to be and are you fulfilling your potential. That little principle has been transformational in relating to people and the kind of relationships that I think helps us be like Jesus. Chip's going to be back with his application, but I want you to know that we're excited about what the Lord may be doing in your heart right now. Our prayer is that he'll use what you just heard to strengthen your faith. If you have any questions or comments, just tap more and give us a call. Well, Chip, I think as parents and grandparents, it's easy to see our kids getting sucked into the comparison game. But so often, they don't want to talk about anything, so it's hard to help them see what's happening. Would you talk for a minute about a new tool we have to help people get the conversation going? Well, Katie, today um, I've got Jerry McCauley here in the studio with me. He's our head of product development, and we've actually created a tool to help people open up that it might be hard for them to open up. And you've kind of used this. Tell us a little bit about how this works with different people's personalities. Yeah, we put together this this product called Discuss This, and it's a deck of 52 cards, open-ended questions that we really believe move people to deeper connection through conversation. And sometimes people aren't necess- necessarily comfortable moving from silence to conversation. So we have some easy questions like, what's your favorite YouTube video? Yeah, And I feel like a lot of kids in this day's culture have a favorite three or four videos that they always go back to to get a good laugh. And so sometimes it's fun just to socialize that, pass the fun around the table and take a look at that video. And then we can move into more meaningful questions too, like where can you be the most yourself mm. and why? And I think if you can't be yourself at your family table or in the car with mom and dad or on a walk. Or with grandmother, grandfather. Yes, or with some friends around the table. Uh, where where's your safe place and so if you can describe that security comes just from the village around you you know and, and what i know and what we've tried to do is it's just can i just say it it's just awkward and it normally doesn't happen and you're the dad or the mom or the friend or the grandparent and you're thinking everything is so superficial get off the stupid phone could we have a conversation but you know it, you can't do it like that and to have a tool where you say hey Let's open this up and let's do this. We've actually seen people open up around a table that normally never would. It's true. And there's these kids or uh, friends that are asking to play more and more often. Like, hey, can we get those cards out? Let's do some more questions together. Or let's all answer this question. Uh, So it's been exciting to see people connecting and also doing the storytelling part of uh, parents telling about their faith to their Mm -hmm. kids. One of the questions is, share a story when God answered a prayer in your family. How did it change the way you viewed God? Wow. And so for a parent or a grandparent to lead out with how God has met their prayer need for their kids or grandkids to see, I think it's an incredible model for them. Well, we know that we're talking about relationships and wisdom in relationships. This is a tool that will help you move down that path in the way that we all want to. Uh, Let me encourage you to get a set. Thanks, guys. Well, to check out the new Discuss This cards, just tap Special Offers. Whether they're for you or for a friend, this 52-card set will give you some great help getting the conversation going. I am so excited about what we learned today. I mean, just pause with me, will you? Can you imagine what would happen in the world? I mean, in relationships everywhere, if all of us just would believe and receive these few lines of truth. The issue is not how I'm doing relative to other people. The issue is how I'm doing relative to who God made me. Am I extracting the potential that he's put in me? Am I fulfilling the purpose and the plan for me? Because here's the deal. I'm not like anybody else. You're not like anybody else. God has a special plan for you. When you compare, you either come away with thinking you're better or thinking you're worse, and both are wrong. The fact is you're different. You're unique. Can you imagine what would happen if little by little you could say in your heart, Over and over, Lord, you love me, you made me, you gifted me, and you brought me to this place and this time for a very specific purpose. I want to be who you made me to be, and I want to fulfill the plan that you have for me. God, would you help me see that? Would you give me the courage to step out and do it? 
I mean, can you imagine the impact that would have not just in your life, but in the lives of believers if we could just pause And you don't need to sing like that person. You don't need to preach like that person. You don't need to lead like that person. You don't need to have mercy and compassion and counsel like that person. You know what you need to do? You just need to be you and take the gifts that God's given you and the passions and even the hurts that you've experienced that make you you. And you need to not compare that person with anyone else, but just say, Lord, What's that look like to bring grace to my family? What's that look like to encourage my friends? How does me, just who you made me, what's that look like showing up at work? Lord, what's that look like in caring for my kids, my spouse, my friends, or my roommate? Here's what I want you to know. Comparison always leads to carnality. Break the habit. Before we close, let me take a second to say thanks to those of you who support Living on the Edge with a monthly donation. Your gifts are making a big difference. If you're enjoying the teaching of Living on the Edge, but don't yet support us financially, would you consider starting that today? To send a gift, just tap the donate button on this app or more and give us a call. Now be sure not to miss our next program when Chip will be in studio to answer your questions about relationships. Until then, this is Katie Kennard saying thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge.